everyone for coming out tonight. I'm Lindy Wishard. I am the president of the Madison Valley Community Council. I also chair the East District Council. Very special thank you tonight to the Bush School for allowing us to host this event in their venue. They did a great job setting up. Thank you. I also want to thank Bob Edmondson, who helped spearhead tonight's event while in the back. about 10 seconds 
after the stop sign goes up. I know many folks are here tonight to applaud their candidates and push them forward and give them uh, a good feeling. But I would really like to ask you to limit your applause tonight. After the opening statements, I welcome your applause. But during the prepared statements, I'd like you to hold your applause so we can get through all the questions and cover as much as we possibly can from the audience questions. I'm asking everyone to be courteous and polite tonight to each other and certainly towards the candidates. And if anyone interrupts the meeting or can't seem to follow the directions that we've all agreed to in this room, uh, you may be asked to leave. I know this sounds kind of onerous, all these rules, but we think it was really important to be certain that um, for the fairness and the equitability of each candidate and respect that we needed to have certain guidelines. So I think we are now ready to begin, and I am going to start with the opening question. And Rob, you are the first one to answer this question. Please introduce yourselves and tell us why you decided to run for city council and why we should vote for you. Good evening. I'm Rob Hearn. Seattle is facing a number of challenges. Affordability, public safety, sustainability, transportation, education. We're also breaking up in districts. What does that mean to us? It means that District 3 will have one voice. It will need four votes to get anything done. We'll need four more, uh, it means that we're going to need leaders who can build allies by building trust, and build trust by working together for common goals. I've done it before. On November 14, 2011, in a room full of reporters with rabbis and ministers, leaders from Labor, Planned Parenthood, the ACLU, and Death of the Families, I launched a campaign called Washington United for Marriage. I build allies by turning out voters to support women's rights, labor rights, immigration rights, to fight for communities of color, to fight for the environment, and to fight for inequality. That's why I got the sole endorsement of King County Democrats. We win not by beating our opponents, we win because we focus on winning them over. We win because we've always had an inclusive and always, uh, we've always had an inclusive and embracing message. I want to apply the same model to the city of Seattle. Improve public safety, to grow public transportation sort of choices, to provide arts and cultural opportunities for our kids, and to build affordable housing, with the sustainable, diverse communities, by building allies, by building trust, building trust by working together for common goals. That's what I do, and I want to do it for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the Madison Park Community Council and the Madison Valley Valley community for allowing me this opportunity to present my candidacy. I have several reasons for running. One, and perhaps foremost, I've watched the people of Seattle disenfranchised by the Tea Party uh, Republicans who are operating in this state. I've watched how the political parties, red, black, green, Republican, Democrat, have all played a political game on the voters of Seattle and the people of Seattle. A good example, the Democratic former chairman of the House caucus is now supporting the socialist candidate in this race. The uh, head of the Democratic uh, uh, King County uh, councilman, who is a Democratic councilman, he supports the socialist in this race. There's been these blurred lines between political parties and all of them seem to be playing the game on the voters of Seattle. We become politically isolated. We have no power, no strength in terms of affecting uh, city government, state government, or federal government. I'm also running because of the dishonest way the incumbent has portrayed the people of this, battle, this uh, city, and the dishonest way she's portrayed the challengers to her campaign, and the dishonest way she represents herself as, an, as a nonprofit, as a nonpartisan candidate, rather than the partisan candidate she is. I have 30 seconds, I'm sorry, I forgive me. I have 31 seconds, forgive me. But the reason why I have chosen to run too is also because of my experience as the Executive Director of the Central Seattle Community Council Federation for a very long time, at which time I saw that neighborhood power is Thank you very much.
might be a bit confusing to the audience because when the timekeeper holds up the stop sign, the audience sees it, but the candidate sees the 30 second mark. Okay? Pamela? And thank you all for turning out tonight. And, and again, I'd like to thank the Madison Park, Madison Valley uh, community for hosting us. I'm really excited to be here tonight. I'm, I'm running for your candidate, for your as your candidate in District Three. I'm one of the two candidates that have lived in the district for over 20 years. I used to could say I was the only one until Mr. Carter got in the race. Um, and um, I'm really proud to be sitting next to a long-term resident of the district. Uh, my son went to Meadie Middle School, he graduated from Garfield High School. I was the vice president and PTSA president for the entire four years he was there. In addition, I'm a founding board member of the Garfield High School Foundation. I'm also a first-generation college graduate, and I'm a proud Husky, and I think that reflects in my yard signs and in my literature. For 12 years, um, I worked with our neighbors to run a Pony League baseball program to keep hundreds of kids off the streets during the summer months. I'm currently the president and CEO of the Urban League. The Urban League is one of the oldest civil rights advocacy organizations in our country. I'm only the second woman in 85 years to hold this position. And over the years, we've advocated for civil rights, voting rights, and police accountability. In addition, we provide programs and services and employment, education, and housing. And these are similar issues that I've heard as I've door built over 3,000 homes in this district. We need leadership on our city council who knows how to bring people together to effectively address housing affordability, our transportation crisis, and to create living wage jobs. My diverse work experience demonstrates why I will be an effective council member, and I understand how neighborhoods work and spent the majority of my 30 years working in city government, working in neighborhoods across the city, and I was a proud union member. District elections were made for candidates like me. I have a track record of success and skills and qualifications to be effective. And whether you live in Madison Park, Madison Valley, Capitol Hill, First Hill, the Central District, or Yesler Terrace, I will be accountable and accessible to all of you. And that's why I'm asking you to vote for me. I will fight for you, I will fight for your families, and I will fight for your future. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Morgan Beach. I'm running for city council for your district today. I am a nonprofit worker in the community. I am a volunteer with Planned Parenthood Votes Northwest. I've been the 44th district chair for a number of years, and I'm a commissioner on the Seattle Women's Commission. And that is what has spurred me to step up and run for city council. Too many times when I've been working on city policy or state policy, I've seen that our progressive values are not living up to our public policies, and that we've relied on rhetoric and grandstanding and symbolic gestures over policy making and governing for too long, and I want to do something different. I'm running to make Seattle the first major city in the country to reach gender equity, to invest in infrastructure like municipal broadband and mass transit and affordable housing that will prepare Seattle for the future, and to have an open and collaborative city hall that represents District 3 and the people who live here and all of our beautiful neighborhoods and attractions. Downtown may be the heart of the city, the city center, where so many businesses create their giant workforce areas, but District 3 is the soul of the city. It is so many beautiful cultural establishments, restaurants, parks, waterfronts, homes, and people who live here and have moved here, to people like myself, because they wanted to be a part of Seattle and a part of what Seattle is about. I haven't lived here for 20 years. I'm just coming up on my third year living in Seattle. That may scare some people, but I moved here in order to call it home. I'm running to be able to build the city that I envisioned in my head when I lived here, and you should vote for me if you want to build that with me. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Shana Sawa. I want to live in a city where all people can work and live in dignity. That is why I have dedicated my year and a half in office to pushing for serious changes. While City Hall is usually the domain of corporate lobbying by big developers and real estate speculators, I have worked to make City Hall accessible to working people and communities. We successfully won a historic $15 minimum wage by building coalitions with workers, labor unions, and the faith community. Earlier this year, I hosted a town hall attended by hundreds 
on the increasing violence against the LGBTQ community in Capital Hill. With Council Member O'Brien, I have helped lead the Council's opposition to Shell's disastrous plan for Arctic drilling. I do not take a penny in corporate cash. Out of my six-figure accounts or paycheck, I accept only the average worker's wage and give the rest to social justice movements. I believe in unity. I reject a Seattle deeply divided by stunning wealth inequality. We urgently need to make big developers pay the maximum linkage fee to fund affordable housing. We need the city to address the housing crisis by building thousands of units of high-quality affordable housing. I am advocating for at least 12 weeks of paid parental leave for all of Seattle's working people. As the Energy Committee Chair, I am calling for municipal broadband to provide reliable and affordable internet access for individuals and small businesses. Seattle has the fourth worst traffic in the nation. We need to tax the super wealthy and big business to fully fund a world-class mass transit for our city. Let's build on what we have begun. Thank you. And Rod, we start with you again. Right. The first question is, since a primary function of the city council is allocation of the city budget, what is your responsibility to taxpayers? In your answer, please provide one example of how you have demonstrated good stewardship of other people's money. Taxpayers don't mind paying taxes when they think it's put to good use and fulfilling the expectations for the service that the city provides. The same is especially true for donors who support nonprofits. After all, unlike taxes, they don't have to give the money. Um, but they're giving because they support the mission of the organization. And I think ultimately the taxpayers of the city are giving because they support the mission of the organization. They're sending the money because you have a mission to enact, uh, whether it's creating opportunity or fighting for equality. From my own experience with the organizations that I've been a part of, you sometimes have to make tough decisions about how you accomplish the mission and how you're going to inspire your supporters to donate. I've made a lot of asks of donors in Equalize Washington. Our donors had pretty high expectations of what we've been able to accomplish and, and the support they provide. We met those expectations. We launched a $12 billion campaign, we won marriage equality, and we have 7,000 or more families today married because of that work. But it's not just that, that's how we win on anything. We provide value, and I think that's what we'll do in City Council. Lee? This is a brand new government. We have the opportunity to create an urban government that can be the model of the city across the country. It's impossible to say what the budget of this district is going to be or what the finances are going to be for this. It's a brand new entity. We don't know what we can do with that. But what I would do with the resources of the office is to immediately begin to look at neighborhood by neighborhood. Each neighborhood, such as the central area, has two or three or maybe four different organized communities. I'm looking for ways to use the city's resources to conduct comprehensive studies of those communities, to determine each community, what the housing needs are, what the security needs are, because they're all different. Every neighborhood has a different need. Housing is not a uniform idea for the city of Seattle. What is affordable housing? If you can afford to live in, a Mac in Magnolia, if you're looking for a house in Magnolia, you can find one if you got the money for it. But what is, there is no such thing as a universal housing uh, solution Thank for you very the much. city. Pamela? I think our responsibility um, as city council members is to ensure there's transparency and sound financial management in managing the city budget. I think people do have expectations when we are asking taxpayers to fund the multi multitude of um, um, programs and services that we provide. I've been an excellent steward of other people's money. As a CEO of the Urban League, I was able to take our budget when I first came in in 2012 that was under $500,000 to a $2.2 million budget in three years. I did that by demonstrating that we as the Urban League have strong outcomes and meet goals. And we, will, we have rebuilt our programs in education, employment, and housing 
using those funds. And when you, when you demonstrate to your donors or your funders or your taxpayers that you're using their money in a transparent and sound financial way, I think that that shows that you know how to manage budgets, and I know how to do that. Thank you. Uh, so I am a nonprofit fundraiser for a living. I literally accept large amounts of cash and checks and deliver them from donors to my organization. Um, I do this every day because I believe in building our communities and uh, all of the work that goes into that. And the number one thing that I've learned in all of that work is delivering what we do on the service side and having transparency and expectations with our donors. Uh, and knowing what we want to accomplish and where we're going. So I think that's what we bring to the table with the city as well, is vision, transparency, and spending the money that the taxpayers deliver wisely. And involving you in the process, I haven't heard that yet. We haven't been out here talking to you about how you want your money spent as much as we should have. And I really want to do that in all the community councils, community meetings, and hear how you want your money to be spent on the city and what your priorities are. The city's budget is a moral document. It reflects the true priorities of politicians. The police department is the biggest annual chunk of Seattle's budget with virtually no oversight. SPD has been identified for racially biased policing and excessive use of force. We need democratic oversight of the SPD, including a thorough audit of its expenses. The birth of Boondoggle is another utter waste of taxpayer resources. Meanwhile, other things are severely underfunded. Human services, mental health services, youth jobs programs, and affordable housing. As chair of the Energy Committee, I stopped an increase in the already big salary of the CEO of Seattle City Light, at the time the highest paid city executive. I successfully allocated funding for wage increases for the lowest paid city workers, basic services for the homeless, and a year in all women's shop. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the second question. This is the second of four questions. How can Seattle accommodate the 120,000 new residents expected in the next 20 years while preserving neighborhood character? Ryan? Uh, ultimately, it's the people of the community that create the character. And any healthy community needs to grow uh, for its character to thrive. Seattle's gone through booms before, and it's important to plan for growth and when growth uh, along to planned infrastructure. But evidence shows that cities, uh, and also it's important to say, uh, cities use half the resident, people in cities use half the resident, uh, the amount of carbon that people in suburbs do. So I think it's a value that we grow as a city, um, and it's our duty for the planet. Um, but that said, uh, I, I, I had a bit of an anecdote about changing character of neighborhoods. I was called a gay slur on Capitol Hill last week by a bunch of guys, uh, and it was, Odd because it was the first time I felt uncomfortable as a gay man on Capitol Hill in quite some time. Uh, we need to grow as a community and bring members of our community into uh, into the, uh, the conversation. I think we need to provide cult cultural opportunities for people to understand the community that we live in. Um, that's why I support increasing opportunities for us and culture in the city. It's a way of integrating. Lee? Every neighborhood has its own housing needs, as I've said before. We cannot simply have the city impose 130,000 homes or houses uh, uh, or apartments or affordable housing in the city. It can't be imposed on the city. Neighborhoods that need that housing have to have the power to ask for them and get them. The neighborhoods who want neighborhood uh, uh, more housing and have the capacity for housing, it's those neighborhoods where the housing should be uh, built. And it's those neighborhoods, that's why I propose the each neighborhood creating a comprehensive plan for their housing needs. There are some who have housing needs for seniors, others who have housing needs for middle-income family uh, members with children. And so each neighborhood, each community is what I want to focus on. There are individual communities that can hold the uh, housing, and there are others who can't. It should be up to the neighborhood. We can't stop people from uh, moving here. We have to have a common sense, of, sense approach to manage growth that doesn't harm our neighborhoods and the residents that live here and have lived here for decades. Um, working in the Department of Neighborhoods, I worked on a lot of neighborhood-based issues, and I was around when they did all these neighborhood plans. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on neighborhood plans that went on a shelf and collected dust. And some neighborhoods were, were ignored. 
they didn't even get a neighborhood plan because they weren't part of an urban village or, 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 or the um, urban centers. And I think we need to, to look at some of that work to figure out where you accommodate growth. And I think you have to include the neighborhoods in it. We need leadership that knows how to bring people together. Um, I've worked on these issues, like I said, in my, in my current job and in, in my job when I worked in the city. And again, we have the resources we need to take those neighborhood plans, we need to look at those plans, and we need to work with our neighbors and our residents to figure out where that growth can happen. Because unfortunately, we can't build a bridge to stop people from here, we can't put up a gate, we're going to come, but we have to do it in a strategic way. We have to be able to manage this growth, and we have to be, uh, develop jobs that are around transit safety. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think the city is responsible for two things with this. It's we need places for people to live and we need a way to get them around the city. Now with all that, that means building more housing and this, uh, regardless of how you feel about it, that means more density. We are water restricted on all sides unless you want to build a suburb on top of Lake Washington, which I don't think is a favorable thing. We need to build up in the city. And there's a lot of ways to do that in between the high rises that are downtown and all of the single family neighborhoods that are out here. And we're missing out on it right now. We're missing the middle. We also need more transit to get around the city. We need to guarantee more mixed income neighborhoods because those are the healthiest neighborhoods that are out there and we can do that. Uh, and really the number one thing for maintaining neighborhood character, both the built environment and the character of the people and the welcoming, welcomingness of the neighborhood is about exclusivity. The minute we say people aren't welcome, or people can't move here, or my neighborhood's growing too fast, that's when we get exclusive, and that's not the Seattle that I moved to be a part of, and I don't think it's the one that anybody here envisions being a part of. Thank you very much. Big developers and giant real estate speculators have run roughshod over neighborhoods while making profits hand over fist. Neighborhoods and communities have little say in what is built in the city. I am advocating for the city to build tens of thousands of new housing units affordable to the many working people who are making Seattle a booming city. We need to leverage the city's excess bonding capacity coupled with federal incentives to make a bulk size investment to build those units which will also create good jobs. We need the maximum legal linkage fee to make big developers pay for affordable housing. Tenants need their rights guaranteed to uh, prevent the epidemic of economic eviction. And lastly, Seattle has traffic gridlock. We need to tax the super wealthy and big business to fund that spend. Thank you all very much. Moving on to question three. Again, we'll start with Rod. How will you work with your council colleagues to get legislation passed? Uh, I have some experience passing legislation. <clears throat> we build uh, support by building coalitions and always having an inclusive message. Always imagining that those who may appear to be your opponents now could become your best allies tomorrow. At the organizations I've been involved with, we've been very successful in making real and lasting policy change, from transgender inclusive hate crimes legislation to marriage equality. It takes a storytelling approach, and you need to empower people to tell their own story. It's not about left or right, it's about focusing on getting something done. That's why we were able to get support of Democrats and Republicans for marriage equality. And if you can do it for something like that, you can do it for anything. I am not a consensus fielder, I have to tell you that. Anybody who, anybody who disagrees with me sometimes, I think they're an idiot. But that comes, from having, that comes from having been in the private sector for the past 25 years. I've never really, never kind of sought out, see myself as as a politician or running for office. And I also look at this new government we are talking about. We have nine new members. We have no idea the personalities of these people. I have no idea how this structure is going to work, how we can build in the alliance uh, that we can build a, a, a consensus with. So you, it might sound as if I'm not running for this office, or I'm not campaigning for this office. I am campaigning for this office, but I think you should know the truth. I am not a consensus builder. <laughs> hey, I'm on. We'll talk. <laughs> um, I think in the new district system that we're getting ready to experience is, is, is you're gonna we need, we're gonna have to collaborate. I think it it makes things it makes it easier to get things done, but again, it takes five votes. And it takes five votes to get legislation passed, and that's not gonna change in the new district council system. 
And I know how, I know the understand, I know and understand the importance of how we build relationships, and I think that those relationships makes our voices more effective. And I know it's not going to be easy, but I don't think you can get there by criticizing and berating uh, and, and or belittling your colleagues. You just can't do it. it. It won't build consensus and you can't get things done. And I think as a representative in your district, you need to have your voice heard. And, you, and I think you need to take into consideration how what happens in three impacts, two impacts, four impacts our city at large. And keeping those um, relationships respectful and collaborative will help get things done and we'll get those five votes for our district. Uh, I, uh, all I can say is as collaboratively as possible. That's, I work with people every day and that's my vision and that's what I like doing. Uh, and not just that, but working with, we have a, like we said, we have no idea who's going to be on the city council next year. It is all going to be a toss up and it is everywhere. And so you can't plan on how you're going to work with people other than how you've worked with people in the past. And to me that is working with groups and working with everybody and telling them about my experiences and translating the experiences of people who I'm representing from the district and taking that to the city council and telling my other counterparts about that. District 5, what have you heard? District 6, what have you heard? This is what District 3 is about. And this is what we care about. And that's what I'm going to take and I'm going to work with them every day. And that's my mission. In the year and a half that I've been on council, my office has shown how to effectively pass strong progressive legislation and win social justice reforms. Many of my proposals have won unanimous votes, like the $15 minimum wage, like the resolution against the disastrous Trans-Pacific Partnership that I worked on with Councilmember O'Brien, and the Indigenous People's Day resolution that I worked on with Councilmember Harrow. Getting legislation passed requires winning over majorities. I have done that by using my council office to build coalitions with regular working people, community members, and social justice advocates. When we organize grassroots efforts, we create the political conditions that enable unanimous or majority votes on progressive legislation. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question of this section, um, we'll start with Rod again. Voters thought the district elections would bring council members closer their, to their constituents. What things will you do to make yourself available to us? I've already started doing it. I'm making my campaign a personal door-to-door -door campaign. I've personally knocked on over 2,000 doors so far, and I'll be over 7,000 by the end of July. Uh, but it will take more than that. Uh, the council members elected from districts will have particularly high expectations when it comes to constituent service. Uh, having worked in retail for the first 10 years of my life, I became part of Seattle's tradition for customer service. The customer's always right. And I think that philosophy will serve this representative as well. I'll look for staff members who have that have and share that responsibility uh, philosophy, and I'll continue to build efforts uh, during uh, that we built during the campaign to continue to meet with community organizations uh, like Madison Park Community Council and Central Madison Community Council, and um, and with you individually. And I look forward to doing that as your representative. I'm looking forward to restarting the neighborhood government movement here in Seattle, one that was started some 65 years ago after the end of the Second World War, when African Americans and Japanese Americans and other uh, Asian Americans put together the Jackson Place Community Council. The Jackson Place Community Council went on to expand to include 80 community councils in the central Seattle area, and that, that, those community councils were confederated under the Central Seattle Community Council Federation. That was a neighborhood power movement that had begun in the 1970s and then was systematically stamped out here in Seattle. You may remember that. And I want to restart that movement. That movement is what can solve some of the key issues uh, facing our federal government. We have an issue called gender wage discrimination. That issue is an immoral, that is an immoral act. We can organize in the Seattle area to make it an illegal act. I too have um, really enjoyed doorbelling, believe it or not, and I think it really gets you connected and you get to know all of our neighbors by this. Um, I'm on, I've, I've done, we've hit over 3,000 homes and I'm trying to get 10,000 before August 4th. I think that's an amazing way to connect with our neighbors and to really understand what people want. Um, for our city moving forward. 
I plan to have office hours um, in the communities and the neighborhoods. I want to utilize our neighborhood service centers, local, small coffee shops, and try to figure out how to do committee meetings in the district. I will take walking tours and continue to patronize our neighborhood business districts and support our small businesses throughout our area. We've got some fine, fine restaurants and, and, and businesses here. I've done it for 20 years and I will continue to do it as a city council member. Our neighborhoods may look different, but we, at the end we all want the same thing. We want to live in safe neighborhoods with great high performing schools, we want living wage jobs, and we want a world class transportation system where we all can live, work, and play in prosperity. Uh, I do doorbelling, attending community council meetings. I've already been going to community council meetings since the beginning uh, of the campaign and even before that. Uh, I believe there's some value in not just doorbelling where we come out and tell you what we think about city policies, but coming to all of the districts where they are, where they already meet. The community councils, the community centers, the district Democrats groups, and everywhere that they are talking about city policy and what's going on here. You get to come and listen to what's already going on in the neighborhoods and adapting myself to that system. So I've already been doing that. I already have a vision for that, continuing that once I'm in city council. Uh, and just being out there talking to you, having an open door every day, show up, talk to me, call me, email me, and I will call back. There's not a single campaign event that my campaign's hosted that I haven't been there personally yet. I was out on Capitol Hill on Sunday morning cleaning up as part of Clean Sweep Capitol Hill and before Pride. I believe in community service as a part of the campaign. Thank you very much. I'm the only sitting council member who supported the district's initiative in 2013. Districts represent less daunting prospects for genuine community and grassroots campaigns to run. Our political system is awash with corporate cash. I am the only candidate in this race who has refused corporate donations. And unlike others, I collected over 3,100 signatures to file for District 3. I take home only the average worker's wage. I have hosted four large town halls through which hundreds of people have gotten politically engaged on affordable housing, on LGBTQ rights, and the city's budget. I have published three newsletters which have reached thousands of people in my district. My office has provided an open door to City Hall to the many who are systematically left out of the political process in Seattle. Thank you all very much. Okay, 
Thank you. Fourth question, should bus rapid transit be extended to Madison Park? Great, thank you. Do you support linkage fees? Lee, do you support linkage fees? <laughs> Questions are this is obviously a yes or no or waffle. The Shell Arctic oil rig in Seattle, is this important or not very? So I guess so. is this important? As an issue. Yeah. As an issue. <laughs> and the last question from the audience should there be a limit to the number of recreational marijuana stores in the Central District? <laughs> Thank you all very much. As I mentioned in our introductory comments, uh, now all the candidates are kind of going to reshuffle themselves and sit in a different seat. Don't forget to take your name tag with you. Capitol Hill, where I used to live, 
uh, Central District where I live now, Madison Park where my grandparents lived, or Madrona where my mom taught when she was a principal. Oh, I taught and was a principal, actually. It helps to have a long history here, and uh, you get to know how the community has grown, evolved, and adapted. Uh, but to do it well, you have to continue outreach constantly. Each community in the district has common needs. Transportation, public safety, affordability. But the specifics are different in each community. It's not one size fits all. I'm looking forward to working with each of you to represent the district authentically, working with the community councils to continue uh, outreach and understanding what's going on, and actually continuing to develop other ways of engaging so that communities can be well presented throughout uh, not just the district, but the citywide. The overwhelming balance of legislation in City Hall favors big developers and the super wealthy. The needs of ordinary working people, elderly, people of color, and the disabled in all neighborhoods are underrepresented. Many of the most important issues, such as the affordable housing crisis and displacement, traffic gridlock, the LGBTQ community centers, are all relevant for all neighborhoods. Similarly, shell drilling for oil in the Arctic and the threat of oil train explosions are also relevant for all, all of us in the city. My goal is to unite working people in all neighborhoods to push to make big developers pay for affordable housing and to tax big business to fully fund mass transit to resolve Seattle's traffic gridlock and reduce the city's carbon footprint. Uh, I have a vision of, I said vision so many times today, <laughs> uh, but I really want to get out and be a part and have conversations with you all, and that's what this is all about. Again, I'm getting repetitive, I've said vision, I've said conversations with you all, uh, but one of the best experiences I've had in this movie in is having conversations and sitting in rooms and listening to people. Uh, a couple months ago, I went to the Madison Park Community Council meeting where they were talking about the bus 11 route, and I heard all of the different opinions on whether or not frequency is more important than direct routes and where people actually take that and go. I've walked in neighborhoods in the Central District, which you wouldn't know about unless you got out of your car and walked around and tried to take a bus somewhere or get food or a grocery store or healthcare. I want to make that a regular thing. I want to come to you where you are, and I want to have regular communication with all of the neighborhood groups that represent here. Because there is a clear discrepancy on the way that these neighborhoods are built. There are crosswalks where there are really a need for them, and there are places where they need more, more bike lanes, more crosswalks. You wouldn't know that unless you get out and talk to the people who actually live in these neighborhoods. And thank you very much. The second question in this section of four questions is, what will you do to make it safer for people to walk, bike, bus, or drive in our neighborhoods? There used to be an organization that was sponsored by the police field that was part of a police department uh, called Community Service Officers. Some of you may remember that, that came out of the Model Cities program. Uh, these were sort of unarmed. Uh, community service officers that serve the neighborhoods. This is what we, the CSO. <laughs> we have, each, each neighborhood has its own security needs. We're back to that where neighborhoods must determine what their security needs are. The security needs of Leshia is a lot different than the security needs of North Capitol Hill. That's why I believe in the concept of empowering neighborhoods and empowering those neighborhoods to grip to, together so they can make those kinds of demands. We also have what's called the emergency disaster preparedness teams. Each neighborhood is, uh, is authorized to have one because we are sitting on the Seattle fault line. I think that we can use city resources to re-engage and train those uh, disaster preparedness teams into a security team. I think one of the reasons people voted to have district elections is so that you would have a voice that you could go to to um, address issues like this in our district. I want, to, I want to assure that our district gets our share of city resources. At times throughout my career, I've seen the city enact policies or implement projects with good intentions, but they didn't realize the negative impacts that they had on our neighborhood. I think one of our biggest challenges is that we're trying to build this world-class transportation system in an already built environment. We need to recognize that we cannot put every transportation load on every street. It's hard to say, people don't like to hear it, but it's the truth. We need better coordination. I'm all for supporting uh, kids through safe route for schools, ensuring that our crosswalks are stripes, and getting our roads repaired, and filling those potholes. As minor as that may seem, you can lose a tire in some of these potholes that are on our streets right now. <laughs> I support 
support uh, keeping bus rapid transit um, where, where it's needed, and I'm also supporting keeping bicycle, bicyclists away from traffic as much as possible. But again, we have to be addressed and not put all modes of transportation on every street. Uh, Vision Zero is a philosophy that our transportation system should reach zero accidental deaths. My grandfather was a Seattle surgeon preventing death and saving lives with a philosophy that I grew up with. I think that's a, a, an approach that medicine takes, and I think it's an approach we should be taking for our transportation system. But it involves working with communities to build safe routes to school, improving bus service, providing uh, safe routes for vulnerable bicycles, and sensibly calming traffic. Uh, but again, it's a community-based uh, approach, and the solutions for one community don't necessarily match to uh, every community. I, I was very pleased to see bike arrows in front of my uh, house in the Central District on my residential street because it encourages bikes to get out of the arterial zones where it can be more dangerous. But the street is filled with potholes, and, and I went biking uh, on, to a meeting on uh, on Saturday, and um, it was like taking my bike through a war zone. We won't encourage people to take bikes into residential streets if the, if the streets are, are, are full of potholes. We need to do more to align the paint with the potholes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Above all, Seattle needs a world-class mass transit system, and for that we need to tax big business and the super wealthy. We also need progressive revenue sources to fund greenways, protected bike lanes, safe routes to school. Vision Zero needs to be our guide. We need big developers to pay transit impact fees. One of the best parts of the MOVE Seattle Transportation Levy is the safety projects such as the protected bike lanes, bus lanes, and the safe routes to school. But over-reliance on property taxes, which, the, which hits the middle class people the most, is a feature. Council Member Lakata has proposed that part of the funding be raised by progressive tax options. I support that initiative. And I intend to move an amendment to the levy to make sure that levy funds are actually spent on safety projects and bus lanes and not down the black hole of the Bertha project. Uh, I, I, like Ron, I support Vision Zero. I think it's, uh, I think it will be hard to actually get there because there's always human error involved in driving on city streets, but I think it's a great way to prioritize policy. Safety should be our number one priority when we're building bikes, sidewalks, roads, and everything. Uh, so I think Vision Zero is a great way to start planning our future. Uh, we do need better transit options. The more we can get people into safer um, mass transit, separated bike lanes, and onto sidewalks that are safe and accessible to everyone, I'm supportive of that. I work, uh, I live in the north part of the district. I work in the south part of the district. I see the difference every day. Rainier Avenue, I have seen people wheeling down in wheelchairs because they couldn't get down the sidewalk because it was too bumpy, it was broken, it was that is so unsafe for cars, for bicycles, especially for the people who have mobility issues in the city and have to navigate it every single day. We need to prioritize mobility and accessibility of everything on top of everything except for safety. Safety first, accessibility second, um, when we're considering all of the training options. Thank you. Moving on to question three. What policies or actions would you support to ensure sufficient, affordable housing? I think, again, it goes back to the knowing what the housing needs are. We say that there's a housing needs. We we're anticipating 180,000 more people living here. Remember, the statistic that came out a couple of weeks ago said that Seattle was the fastest growing city statistically. It's not the fastest growing city numerically. And so I don't want to fall into a panic line and benefit developers uh, needlessly. Each neighborhood will have to assess their own housing needs. The city council person that you, you elect is going to have to collect that information and then make decisions then. I can't give it a black blanket answer to the housing uh, crisis when we absolutely don't know what the crisis is at this point. Depending on who you are, if you're a senior worried about your increasing property taxes, a student looking for affordable rents, a single mom seeking safe and affordable housing. I think a lot of us are concerned about what housing affordability is and what it looks like. While the city has made great investments over the years, it's obvious we haven't kept up with the pace or the demand. And I know one thing, that rent control is not the answer because it doesn't, it doesn't generate units and it creates false hope. 
I think we need to look at options in our city. I think I've heard from bonding capacity to looking at where the housing dollar, housing levy dollars are going, and even um, the city getting involved in housing with building on vacant city land. And again, we haven't done that. I, I don't know the how much is out there, but I've heard all those things floated, and I think they all need to be, all need to be considered. We have a lot of tools. I think we need to look at best practices. And I think we need to, um, uh, again, I think there's a housing committee that, and we have to look at what, what those recommendations are. Um, it's, it's expensive, it's, it's, it's gonna be an expensive fix, and, and just like we said, we, don't, we just don't know the exact numbers. Thank you very much. Despite housing is not keeping up with demand, it's great that high sales are providing so many jobs, uh, and it's great that so many people see the value of moving in Seattle, but we need to make more housing available fast. We should be, make it easy for people to build mother-in-law units, and we should encourage the, build, uh, the building of housing that is affordable for all income categories. There are many ways we can do this, and I look forward to working with uh, a lot of people to come up with best practices for that. When it comes to building lower-income housing, I support a capital housing's community-based approach. Each community has different needs, and community-based organizations like capital housing are best suited to create creative, low-income, and mixed-income housing opportunities to enrich character and of the neighborhoods. Ultimately, it's about building dynamic, diverse communities. Housing is just part of that. Seattle faces a huge crisis in affordable housing. Urgent and bold solutions are needed. We need maximum linkage fee on big developers to raise tens of millions of dollars to fund affordable housing and inclusionary zoning to require developers to increase affordable housing stock. I have proposed that the city use its bonding capacity to build thousands of units of high-quality city-owned affordable housing. Tenants need six months notice for rent hikes over 20% and relocation assistance in case of economic eviction due to skyrocketing rent. We need rent control to limit rent increases to levels sustainable for both working people and small businesses in our neighborhoods. Candidates who take campaign funds from real estate corporations like Vulcan show that they will neither be able to win affordable housing nor respect the rights of our neighborhoods. We'll have a chance here in a moment. Uh, so I'm the only renter running in this race, and it is extremely concerning to me uh, the affordable housing uh, access uh, that's going on here. And I think we need, uh, like Councilmember Swat said, we need more tenant protections and we need them now. Um, I worry every year when my rent increase comes up uh, that I may not be able to afford the increase and it doesn't go up the same amount as my uh, my cost of living raise at work. I know that I work for a nonprofit. I will never be able to buy a house in this neighborhood at the way things are increasing right now. And that's extremely concerning to me because I've always had a dream to own property and a beautiful home. But I think there are models that we can do. We need more density. Uh, the light rail uh, mixed-use development that's going above the Capitol Hill light rail station I think is a great model for making sure that we have affordable housing. They have 20% of their units are permanent affordable housing. Another 38% are below market rate for 12 years so that they can catch up with the market rate and the rest are all market rate and mixed use in that thing. That is a great way to build new multi-unit buildings in our areas. It, it increases cultural access and housing for everyone. Thank you very much. And the last question in this section is, we'll start with Lee again, what issue is not being talked about enough on the campaign trail? The issue of senior citizens uh, that particularly affect women, uh, particularly would be wage debt uh, discrimination. That is the number one issue for me in this campaign, and I think it should be the number one issue for the third district. Senior women in poverty is growing at a rate that is alarming. Senior women over 80 are double the number of men over 80 in this country and in this city. And the fastest growing population of in poverty are women who have long, Thank long you very worked much. hard. Oh, oh, sorry, it's 30 seconds. My apologies. <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> have worked hard, and now they don't get the same pension as men and they're living in poverty now. We can address that issue. That is an issue very much, that is an economic issue very similar to redlining. It was, a, redlining was immoral. Income discrimination is immoral, and it should be made illegal, and we can do that. We have the power to do it. We've done it before. Thank you very much. 
very much, and my apologies again. Living wage jobs, job creation. We're not talking about it, it needs to happen. Because if, if we don't have folks working in uh, living wage jobs near transit centers, we're going to see the income inequality happen and spread. We've created a jobs program at the Urban League, it's called Career Bridge, where we are focused on employing people that have had multiple barriers to employment, be it underskilled, undereducated, some have been incarcerated. I know how to do this. We need to scale it up. It's working. We have a 78% retention rate after the first year. The men are tied to um, South Seattle College where they're getting college credit, they're getting paid stipends, and we're providing wraparound services, including rents, rent, helping them with rent and helping them find um, affordable rents or places to stay. And that's what we need to be talking about because we have to address income inequality, and the only way we can do that is through job creation and getting people in living wage jobs. Uh, for me, it's access to arts and culture opportunities. Arts and culture are the Seattle's, our Seattle's superpower. It's the real reason people live in cities. It's an equity issue because arts and culture opportunities help lower income people uh, than they do those with better means. It's an environmental issue because it, it attracts people who live in cities and they burn less carbon here than they would if they lived in suburbs. It's an education issue because kids with arts and culture opportunities do better in science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's a business issue because arts leads to inspiration, and inspiration leads to innovation. Lastly, it's an issue for the soul, not just for the soul of the city, but for each of our souls. It's how we understand each other, share our hopes and dreams. It's about how we are individually and what we need to be together. We have tremendous arts and cultural organizations in the city, and with a little leadership and a little leverage, we can get them to do more. With the most regressive tax system in the nation, Washington state tax system is completely broken, affecting women and people of color the most. City elected officials need to show real leadership on progressive taxation and not simply pass the buck by saying Olympia won't do anything. City council needs to pass progressive measures that are within the city's purview, such as linkage fees, transit impact fees, business head tax, increases in commercial parking tax. Beyond that, city politicians need to demand Olympia repeal the ban on a millionaire's tax and a capital gains tax. It is ultimately a question of political will. Most politicians rely on donations from big business, companies like Vulcan, Goodman Real Estate, and Comcast. These corporations care only about expanding their profits and have City Hall at their beck and call. We need candidates who take no corporate money and are only accountable to working people and to communities. Uh, I think gender equity is the number one issue that not enough people are talking about in this. It's why I decided to run, and it is my number one priority. I don't want Seattle to be the number one city for gender equity in the country. Uh, and it's not just the wage gap, although at the median wage, women make $16,000 less than men uh, per year in the city of Seattle. And if you take the median rent, that is over a year's worth of rent that we are putting women behind every single year. Great, thank you. I think we another round of applause. Six months. Just 
squat. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I will. Yes. Lean, yeah, I'll start with you. Do you have one? No. Okay. All right, I'll start at the other end. Morgan is Independent Pizzeria. Shana is Cafe Flora. Scoop du jour. Oh, soup du jour. Scoop du jour. Thank you. Thai ginger tonight. Thai ginger. Stop, Lee. Okay. It could be Madison. It could be Madison. Great, thank you. And the last question in the lightning round, have you ever walked or rode a bike on a Seattle Greenway? Great, thank you all very much. I'd like to make you to shuffle your seats one more time. I'm sorry? Then audience questions, yes. We need to generate the political will of the council and 
uh, as a person who is not taking any corporate money and linked with working people and people of color and poor people in the neighborhoods, I think it is uh, extremely critical that I can play that role. Thank you. Lee? I'm, I'm trying to restrain myself a little bit <laughs> because dishonesty is one of the reasons why I'm in this race and dishonesty on the part of the incumbent is why I'm in this race. But I will answer your question. I would like to serve on the local government or the government affairs committee, and particularly the office of intergovernmental affairs, because you may recall it, I, I met Pamela that the uh, office of government affairs or neighborhood affairs was started at, during the Aurora administration and right after the Central Seattle Community Council Federation's demise. The idea was the office was to be a catalyst for citizen participation. We are so good at citizen participation and in uh, ensuring corporate responsibility in the city that we open an office so other cities can come here and learn how to do it. But unfortunately, when we opened that office, we took all of the neighborhood activists and, activists and community activists out of the community and gave them government jobs. And that's what resulted in the weakening of the community councils. Thank you. Pamela? When I started my career in the city um, a long time ago, um, housing, human services, and economic development were all in one department. And I would like to see those departments collaborate better because I think those are the basic social justice issues that are facing our city today. If people are, are if we're put, putting enough money into human services to provide that support to get people out of homelessness, address their mental health issues and drug and alcohol issues, um, creating, doing job creation, supporting small business. The majority of our small businesses in our city are 10 people and under. We need to create jobs um, to support folks like that and, and then the housing issue. So all three of those things should be together. And I think the challenge of our city right now is we have 28 city departments working in silos and we have to get our city departments back working together again like in the good old days of the 80s when there was one department. And that would, that would be a, an ideal department or a committee for me to chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, how important are the arts to you and how do you personally participate in the arts? Uh, I mean, they're very important. They're a huge part of the city. They're a huge part of what has made it attractive for not only people but corporations to move here and move their businesses here and start businesses here. Uh, it's what makes it uh, not a city where people come and then it hollows out at night. Uh, it's what allows people to live and do something downtown and in Capitol Hill and in Madison Valley, so it's not just uh, when they work and go home. So I participate, I'm, I'm not a very good artist, I do some amateur photography again, so I won't claim that I do art, uh, but I do love going to the theater productions in town, the art exhibits. Um, I support one of those. Um, Uh, yeah, well, obviously I'm a big supporter of the arts, um, which is why I mentioned it earlier, but um, sadly I lack particular talent. I do love to sing, and I have a piano that I plunk away on, but as long as no one else is listening. But it means a lot to me. I think that's true for a lot of people, though. Um, I think uh, I like to support the arts uh, as a donor, uh, as somebody who uh, organizes um, and brings out people to arts events, uh, and um, I'd like to be able to continue to do that, uh, and I will do it no matter what I do next. Thank you. Sean? Arts are extremely important to the majority of people in Seattle, including me. They bring a vibrant culture and the metropolitan feel that everybody looks for when they move to Seattle. I support grassroots art efforts on a personal level, including theater, writing workshops, and art walks. But above all, as a council member, I see arts as a social and economic justice issue because artists are increasingly finding Seattle an unaffordable and unlivable place. And if we can't make sure that they can uh, uh, live productive lives here, we won't have any art in the city. And that is why I take this issue very seriously, the question of affordable housing, mass transit, 
and uh, equality in many of these issues, dealing with wealth inequality, and also providing an LGBTQ community center is extremely critical, especially in Capitol Hill, because a lot of the artists that are finding it hard to live are especially trans artists and other members of the LGBTQ community. Thank you. The arts world plays an important part to this city's economy. It's also what attracts uh, seniors to this place. It's become the third most uh, important place uh, in the country for uh, attracting senior citizens, and they come here a lot of it because of the arts uh, community. Also, the economy is booming as a result of the arts community. And you may know that already theaters in New York, before they try out their and bring out their productions and bring their productions to New York, it's become economically feasible to start those productions and get them ready here in Seattle. So this employs Seattle artists. Uh, also, several, I can only say that the author of Roots, Alex Haley, I knew him very well, he loved this city and he died here. And there are other artists that have made this their home and I can understand why. This is a great arts community I'm proud to be in. Thank you. Helen? I too um, am art challenged. I can't sing, I can't dance, I can draw, but I sure support the arts because we have some phenomenal artists here. Um, I love going to live theater, I love going to plays, um, I like going to art, art exhibits, but everybody can't afford to do that in our city. And I think that um, one of the things that, um, in the day the city used to give away free tickets um, to the zoos and the aquariums and to the art museum, and, and I love that we do have the ability on a certain Thursday that you can go to the Northwest African American Museum and, and see the displays or go down to Sam. And I think we need to support that. It is, like Council Member Shavant said, a social justice issue. Um, I think we need to support more youth arts here, the Vera Project, um, Project for, for Young People, because I think having a creative, artistic way to get out some of the, um, their talents is really important. And I don't think we support enough arts in the schools and enough programs outside of school time. And I think we need to uh, look at ways that we can do that. And I think we do that through our arts and cultural affairs in the city department. Um, so again, love the arts. I'm sad that everybody can't partake and we need to figure out ways that we can get more people involved. Thank you very much. Now the next question is, what is your plan for improving the streets in District 3? The streets? The streets. Do we already talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, it, investing in the, the new Seattle levy makes a huge part of it, and the safety projects and, you know, that type of thing. So, I, I mean, my plan is to focus on talking to people, hearing what the challenges are. Uh, they, it is different uh, in every neighborhood, and just because we are a smaller District 3 does not by any means mean we are homogenous. Uh, and we need to listen and see what the issues are in everyone and address them as they come, uh, while building to that bigger vision of I'm going to take a slightly take on that question, and that is that um, we need to do more to improve our public safety system in the city. Um, we have new leadership in the police department, which is great, and we need to support her efforts to drive uh, improvements in the public safety that the police are providing. Uh, we also need to build trust between our community and the police department. They are our police department, even if we um, feel like they have not been serving us well in the past. Uh, I think there's two sides of the question. You know, we have John T. Williams, who was killed a few years ago by a police officer who didn't know what he was doing, obviously. Uh, and we also had uh, Montfort, who killed a police officer uh, just two blocks from my home. Um, we have to bring the issues of these two. These two things are real. They inform the, uh, the disparate communities between the police and the people that, were, that the police serve. We have to do more to bring these two communities together so they can serve each other back. Interpreting the question as a, something about physical infrastructure, uh, I have, uh, as I've already said, the move Seattle levy does bring up many uh, points about uh, protected bike lanes, safe routes to school, uh, and uh, funding greenways. And also, uh, we need to think about disabled access in, on sidewalks, fixing the potholes, and so on. But at the end of the day, I think this brings up the question of where do the priorities lie of corporate politicians. Look at the amount of money that has been sunk into the Bertha project that is going nowhere fast, or nowhere slowly, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> 
Uh, and look at the amount of money that's been sunk in the exclusive project of the Mercer Street Corridor in the South Lake Union. How about funding for our neighborhoods? This is again a question of political will on the council, and that is precisely what I'm doing, generating the political will for funding for regular people. Thank you. Me? Under this structure, you're going to find that more and more neighborhoods will have to fend for themselves in terms of fixing their potholes and in terms of their own security. Many neighborhoods have already done that. Those who can afford to do that, they've uh, been forced to uh, incorporate local improvement districts in order to fix their potholes. Magnolia, as an example, has uh, uh, created a, a local improvement district to hire additional police officers for security. That's what this districting is going to mean, neighbors. It's going to mean that the burden of many of these needs are going to fall on you. You're going to wind up taxing yourself in order to fix your potholes. Be prepared for that. I think it's going to be a challenge to figure out how to prioritize our needs in such a diverse um, district. However, I think we have to go back and, and uh, assess what has happened with this neighborhood planning process as well as look at what the master bicycle plan and the master um, pet plan says. Um, because I, don't, I, I haven't got into those details, but I think that's one way you can look at it to see what other people have recommended for my district or talk to people that were involved in those processes. Again, I want to address, can I have all modes of transportation on every street? I'm going to say that throughout this campaign because I think a lot of what happens is causing congestion in our district is from trying to accommodate all things for all people. We just cannot do that. We need to prioritize um, safe, safe routes to school. We need to prioritize um, accessibility for people that are disabled or are not able-bodied. And um, I'll just use 23rd Avenue for, for an example. They shut it down northbound today. I don't know if y'all have tried to drive up there. It's a mess. And people cannot get to the bus stops in wheelchairs. How it's set up. It's very frustrating. Thank you. And the next question is from the audience. Um, a little bit out of the neighborhood, but how would you help Capitol Hill small business the restaurants in particular, with the cost of operating under the new minimum wage rate? Uh, under the new, I think uh, we went a route that when we enacted the minimum wage law, that was a, a good compromise um, from where we were. Uh, but I think one of the number one things in the conversations I've had with people who run businesses, my, my friends and people I've just gone out and talked to, uh, is that uh, they need assistance in supporting uh, benefits for their employees. Uh, particularly the things that make equal for women to be a part of the workforce, and that's access to paid parental leave uh, and childcare uh, that allow women to be an equal part of the workforce. I think we can start developing a way to earmark city funds to help small businesses, particularly the ones in the city who the majority of the ones in this district are under 10 employees, uh, help them provide that so that as they grow and get bigger, it is a part of their business model, uh, and that they see that having equity in the workplace and having a living wage is good for business. So helping, um, helping earmark city funds to help, uh, and working with the Office of Labor Standards to make sure we're not penalizing when we should be educating businesses on how this is going to work for them. Right. Um, well, there's two sides of the profitability. There's the cost side, and then there's the uh, the um, the profit, the, the income side, and I think the city can do more to support the uh, efforts of uh, small businesses to promote themselves to attract customers. Um, I think that we have uh, some incredibly cool businesses on Capitol Hill. Uh, a lot of them provide great value, and I think when customers see the value, they, they're willing to pay for it, and that includes uh, paying for the uh, higher costs uh, that are supporting uh, living wage workers. This system almost exclusively benefits big businesses and places severe obstacles in the paths of small businesses. Many small business owners I've spoken to support decent living standards for their workers and indeed for everybody. What small businesses are looking for is support to survive and sustain themselves. They need rent control, especially uh, storefront businesses need rent control because rent is a big part of what they pay and many of them have said when you pass rent control, let's talk. And uh, we also need a municipal bank to provide low interest loans for uh, startup businesses, especially for businesses of color, for people of color, for low income women, 
and uh, small businesses will also particularly benef benefit from public initiatives like our 12-week paid parental leave for all workers in this city so that small businesses are not burdened by that. And also, as a matter of fact, if we had single-payer health care, it would make it much easier for small businesses. Thank you. Lee? I agree uh, that community banks are going to be the future for neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are going to have to find ways to finance themselves, really. Uh, and community banks is one of them, where the city's money, instead of investing it in Bank of America or putting their funds in Bank of America, they can put those funds into community banks, specifically for small business lending, mortgage lending, to, uh, even uh, credit unions. Those can be formed at the neighborhood level. Community councils and communities that are organized will find that they have these abilities. They can build uh, public, private, nonprofit mixes in order to subsidize business. A good example is the urban mix. The urban league, when I first came here, the, I was a reporter. I never had a job. I'm looking for my first job as a reporter. The station that wanted to hire me, they couldn't hire me uh, because they just didn't have the money, but they wanted to hire me. But they sent me to the urban league, and the urban league, as a fact, gave me a, a, a stipend as an on the job trainee. So I got my first job because the urban league was supporting the small business. Thank you. Um, I've met with a lot of small business owners on the campaign trail, and um, I think we need to ask them. Um, I think one of the things one of them said to me is, you know, we have a commission for almost everything, but there's not a commission for small business in the city. And I thought, wow, what a cool idea. Maybe we need to look into that. I also think we need to better utilize the Office of Economic Development. We need people working in that office that have run our own small business. You can't take a social worker to tell a small business owner or help a small business owner write a business plan. So we have to make sure that we have the um, proper staff in city government in order to support this. I too believe in trying to figure out a way to help with health care costs. Because at the Urban League, one of the things I had to do was restore health care. And it's expensive and it's hard. And so maybe we could have something like a single payer or some kind of collaborative way that small business can join together to get lower, lower health care for their, for their employees. Um, so I think um, we have, and another thing is um, doing some kind of incubator space where we can help small businesses or people that have an idea to develop, provide more support, more city support in that effort. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is, what key points differentiate you from the other candidates? What key points? Uh, we'll go a little bit demographically first. I uh, am a millennial, so I'm quite young. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know what everybody else's age is, but uh, <laughs> I'm the youngest person running. Uh, I am the only renter uh, who is uh, running right now, so I, I have um, a real stake. Uh, and I come from an activist background on women's issues. Uh, so I am the only candidate uh, that is prioritizing gender equity very clearly as my number one issue because it feeds into all of the others we are, we are talking about today. Uh, access to arts and businesses and housing and transit and affordability. Uh, if you're building on a system that treats women so unequally, and out of the 50 largest cities, if you haven't heard this stat yet, uh, that pay women uh, differently than men, we are ranked the worst. And that is embarrassing for us in the city of Seattle, and we should remedy that now. Uh, and so that is, I'm the only candidate prioritizing that as my number one uh, issue in this campaign. Thank you, Brett. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. I'm the only one named Rod. Um, no, but I, I, I'm independent. Uh, I'm, I, I guess I'm the only gay candidate. Uh, I am the only one endorsed by King County Democrats, um, and I'm very proud of that endorsement. Um, I also am probably the only candidate who's endorsed by prominent Republicans and Democrats. Um, I, uh, what else can I say? The only fourth generation. Uh, candidate, right? Uh, no. um, oh, I'm probably the only singer. <laughs> the fundamental difference between me and other candidates is my clarity that in order to successfully serve the interests and honestly serve the interests of working people and all those who are marginalized and oppressed, I need to be beholden only to working people and not to big business. Therefore, I'm, only the, I'm, I'm the only candidate in this 
Gateways who has explicitly refused corporate donations. I did that when I ran in 2013 as well. And as I said, unlike others, I collected over 3,100 signatures to file for this district. And I take home only the average worker's wage of $40,000 and inject the rest of my six-figure salary after taxes into a solidarity fund to help social justice work. My office is the, virtually the only office open for some of the most marginalized people, like homeless people. Another example is the indigenous people uh, and the activists who were trying to pass indigenous people's state for a long time and succeeded because they had their own voice in City Hall. Thank you. Hey. I'm the old guy. <laughs> I'm an old person. I'm interested in old person's issues. That distinguishes me. I'm also a veteran. And I'm also an honest person. Um, it's, I'm also the only nonpartisan here on this panel running for a nonpartisan seat. I take no political endorsements from the Democrat, Republican, or Tea Party, or Socialist Party. I accept no money from organizations outside of the central area. I accept no corporate or PAC money, have never. You go to my website, you'll see that I've raised $25. I plan on spending $5,000 and probably of my own money to run this campaign. I'm not rich. I have to dip into my savings account in order to come up with my uh, filing fee for this seat. So the dishonesty on the part of the incumbent to suggest that I take corporate money, when after all, look at the tens of thousands of dollars that she has uh, conducted from the unions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from political parties. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe I'm the only first generation college graduate. Um, I think my work history Congratulations, I did not have one. Okay, second, um, I'm the only uh, multi-ethnic person on the uh, running right now. I'm African American, my mother was Japanese and Chinese. Um, I can say I've lived in the district the second longest after Mr. Carter. Um, I'm the only one that was the PTSA president of Baldwin Garfield High School. Um, and I think my work history, that um, I have 30 years of working in city government in various positions um, increasingly uh, responsibility, and I'm the only president CEO of Urban League, and that has um, really garnered a lot of um, experience and great working relationships in our city. And because I, li I think I'm the only one that lived and actually works in the district as well, so that makes me a little bit unique. But you, you live and work in the district too. Okay, I'm second to Mr. Carter. I'm going to vow him. And that, that's what makes me unique. Thank you. The next uh, question is. Partly a question, partly a statement from the person that wrote it. So you have to take that into consideration. But it says here, obviously we need to increase tax revenue in a way that isn't regressive. But as a young family, we're getting priced out of our own neighborhood. What plans do you have for progressive taxation other than raising my property taxes yet again? Uh, I think we have uh some ability to use our borrowing power uh, that we haven't yet. Uh, property taxes are what we go to over and over again. And while we believe, I think, as a community, in paying for what uh, we want to see as services in the city, uh, we can't keep doing it. Uh, it's unsustainable in the long run. I also think we need to start uh, building partnerships with other local governments outside just the city of Seattle. Uh, it is not just Seattle residents who use buses uh, and stuff here who live in Issaquah and Shoreline in King County, and we need to start spreading it out and building partnerships, especially uh, for transit. But for all of the things, Seattle leads the way, but we can start spreading this cost out. We can't pick up the check every time that there's a bus cut. I, we want to do it, but we, it won't last in the long run, so we need to build better partnerships with our neighbors outside of the city of Seattle. Thank you. Uh, the state's revenue system is an embarrassment. Uh, it's crazy when your revenue system is more aggressive than Texas. I mean, it's just nuts. Um, and um, the city, of course, can't do its own income tax without uh, getting the state's permission. Uh, we, uh, I think we need also a state-level income tax. Uh, I think a capital gains tax at state level, like Democrats are, are supporting this year. The state budget is incredibly important. 
Uh, but um, it's going to take advocacy outside of the city. We're gonna, the, the center of gravity when it comes to things like aggressive revenue isn't in the city of Seattle. It's well outside of it. We need to support uh, the effort to build the coalition for progressive revenue uh, in, for the whole state. And the risk of repeating myself, as uh, I've said before, there is an over-reliance on property taxes on the city level because city politicians are not willing and not able to fight for changes in the state, advocate for changes at the state level. City elected officials need to show real leadership on progressive taxation and not simply pass the buck by saying Olympia will not do anything. City Council needs to pass progressive measures that are within the purview of the City Council. Why don't we pass the maximum linkage fees, transit impact fees on developers, a business head tax as an alternative, business head tax and increases in commercial parking tax as an alternative to squeezing middle class people with the property taxes. Beyond that, city politicians need to demand that Olympia repeal the ban on progressive taxation. We need city officials to be playing their leadership role, using their office to push for a millionaire's tax and a capital gains tax. But ultimately, all this is a question of political will. If you take money from the same corporations that don't like these taxes, you are not going to do it. Thank you. Simple answers were really difficult problems. The state controls how you are taxed. I, as deputy director of the Washington State Commission for Constitutional Alternatives, it seems like forever ago, my job was to help Governor Dan Evans fix this problem with state government. We need a constitutional convention. We have to rewrite the Washington State Constitution in order to address this. We came close. I traveled the state, I traveled every county of the state trying to drum up the support for uh, a constitutional convention back in 1975. We came just three votes short of getting a constitutional convention. Convention Today, you have the Tea Party Republicans in complete control of the state. You don't realize that. But it is. And the city of Seattle has become isolated. We need those partnerships uh, that was talked about earlier. We have to have the rest of the state. We have to bring it together. We have to have a constitutional convention to rewrite a government that was structured in 1889. This was a great constitution, believe me, believe it. This was a, and it was all men who created it. This had, this is a constitution that had equal access to education regardless of race, color, or creed. This was the first constitution in the country. It's a great constitution, but it's a heck of a mess when it's a structural. Thank you. I too uh, believe that we're, we're, we're taxing ourselves out of our city um, with all the property taxes and as great as the initiatives and the levies are, we have to look at it another way. And I, I believe it is looking at a state income tax because it, it's more equitable. If we continue to, you know, take our, prop, our not our property tax, but even our, our sales tax up, it's, it's almost 10% in some places. And, and, I, and I think that duly, unduly impacts low income and, and middle income families. And so again, it's working, it's, it's taking that leadership um, and taking uh, and, and having your colleagues to say, we definitely need to go down to Olympia and look at how, how, how it's structured because we cannot continue to, to tax, you know, increase our property taxes. None of us will be able to, I can't afford my place on my income today. Um, and, and it's really scary. And so I think we, we have to look outside, you know, the regular, systems and, and, and trying to be creative and, and work regionally um, and, and across the state. Thanks, Pamela. Um, I'd like to say on behalf of the Madison Park Community Council, it would be delightful to work with one of you <laughs> at some point in the future. I'm sure I'll still be around and I'm sure Lindy Wish will still be uh, looking after taking the helm of uh, Madison Valley Community Council, so I'm sure both of us will certainly be working with uh, one of you in the future, and I really thank you for all the effort that it takes to run. I mean, I think people underestimate um, the effort that goes into running for a political office, especially a political office, where you're not highly financed, as you point out, um, and the amount of just legwork that it takes, uh, just going around the city, coming to things like this, using up every evening. So, thanks very much to all of you in particular, um, and I'll turn it back over to Barbara to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sure the candidates by this point will be glad to know this is the closing statements. And as promised earlier, everybody will have one minute 
to close. We're going to go in the opposite order that we started. And um, I'll help you through this, but tell you right now, remind you of who, who's first, second, third, and so forth. Shama, you'll go first. Morgan, second. Pamela, third. Lee, fourth. And Ron will finish. So let's start up with closing yes, statement. Yes, and you can have one minute. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. This fall, voters have an important choice. Should the city council represent working families, or should it return to the status quo of decades with representatives who have the seal of approval from the Chamber of Commerce and the Restaurant Association? Our movement has much to be proud of. The fight for 15 is spreading to cities all over the U.S. and we won millions in additional funding for social services. We need to take that fight forward. A representative of working people needs to be very clear. The status quo persists not only because of cynicism and corruption, but because of the notion that you can represent both big business and ordinary people. You cannot. That is why I accept no corporate donations. That is why we must base ourselves on the energy and commitment of ordinary people to win social change. I appeal to you to get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Morgan? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, so much. This was um, I, a, a beautiful night, a long time to spend inside uh, listening to us talk about everything. Uh, but like I've been saying the whole evening, uh, I live and work in this district. I moved here to be a part of the city, uh, and I hope that you want to build the city with me and share my vision for what I want to do. Uh, first, my number one priority uh, is being the first major city in the country uh, to reach gender equity, particularly gender equity and pay. Uh, it is way past due for us to do something about that, and we can do it. Um, like Mr. Carter said, uh, there are tools in our tool belt like that. I also believe that we need to invest in infrastructure today that is going to build the city for tomorrow. We are behind now because we didn't have a vision far enough in the future. And we can build uh, municipal broadband and more affordable housing. And if we do it now, we can do it in a way that is beautiful, creates a beautiful built and natural environment around us. So we have to start right now, envisioning 20 years, 30 years, 50 years down the road. And finally, uh, I believe in an open and collaborative government every day. Like I said, there we go. Time's up. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Pamela? We need effective leadership on the city council. We need people that know how to bring people together to effectively address all of these pressing issues around transportation and housing and public safety and economic development and creating living wage jobs. I think my, uh, I know that my diverse work experience and my background makes me an effective city council person. I understand how neighborhoods work and I, and I spent, like I said, the majority of my career working in neighborhoods across the city. And I think our voices need to be heard at a neighborhood-based level and that's where I come from. Again, district elections were made for people like me. I have a track record of success. I have the skills and the ability to get things done in our district and for our district. And I want to represent, represent all of you. I'm talking from Madison Park, Madison Valley, to the to, to Yasser Terrace, to the Central District, First Hill and Capitol Hill. I want to be accountable and accessible to all people. And whether you give me no money or you max out on my campaign, it won't give you any less or any more ex of ability to talk to me. I will, I will represent you. I will take your phone calls. I will take your meetings. And again, I will fight for you. I will fight for your family. I will fight for our future. Thank you very much. Lee? One of the reasons the people of Seattle decided they want a nonpartisan city council is because political party ideologues see the world through the eyes of their party and not the world as it is. I am an independent. I am a nonpartisan. I accept no union money, no labor money, no organizational money, or endorsements. But the other reason I guess I want to run for this office is because of my experience. So 14 years almost as a reporter in Seattle covering politics and local government has given me some insights on how it works. One year and a half as director of the Community Council Federation gave me an idea as to the power of neighborhoods. I've seen the power of the people of Seattle come together in the neighborhoods to make effective change, not only in this city, this state, but in this country. And I believe sincerely 
that it takes a neighborhood to raise our children, to care for our elders, and to change America. Thank you. And Rod? I'm very happy to be in this forum here. My grandmother grew up in a house just up the hill. Uh, my father, a few blocks to the north. My mother was the principal of Madrona Elementary School. She worked hard to make sure all the kids and teachers there were getting the resources they needed to succeed. She fought her whole life for equity in education. And, uh, and she and my family inspired me to get involved in the civic life of my community. And I've worked hard as a volunteer and activist in Seattle and Washington to make uh, this, is a, this is a great place to live. I played a big role in moving legislation at the state level, and I think a lot of the issues we're facing in Seattle are beyond just the city of Seattle and not unique to Seattle, but it's something we need to solve at the state level. That's why King County Democrats gave you their sole endorsement. To succeed, we need to build bridges and build trust with each other. Bridges between the communities of District 3, bridges between District 3 and the other districts of the city, bridges between the city and the legislature. Together we can take on transportation, homelessness, public safety. Let's enrich the lives of our kids and our communities with arts and culture. Let's work for the next generation together. Thank you all very much. I would like the audience to join me in singing. Thank you for such a respectful and thoughtful presentation tonight. Um, it was a real pleasure uh, getting to work with all of you and getting to know your views, and I think it was very helpful to our audience. And a big, big thank you to the audience um, for all their considerations tonight and their respectfulness to the candidates. Um, Lindy would like to make some very quick closing remarks. Um, so I hope to see you on the campaign trail, and thanks again for running. Real quick, thank you to everyone for coming out this evening. It was very important for us to host this particular candidate forum. One of these people is going to represent our neighborhood. If you can share the information you've learned tonight with your friends, your neighbors, other voters, that is what's going to help encourage our Seattle District 3 neighborhoods to continue to improve as we move forward into the future. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Camera? Can we take it?